Welcome American Literature friends. This is another video. This is part two of Billy Collins. We're gonna go through four of his poems, try to be as efficient and quick as possible. Uh, these should be the second batch of poems on your list on the syllabus. This video is gonna cover Sonnet, which is in the book on page 823, uh, The Afterlife, which is in D linked in D2L, The Best Cigarette, uh, which is linked in D2L, and Splitting Wood, which is linked in D2L. So we're going to go through th those four poems as quick as possible. Um, I, and my main focus as we go through them is going to be on this line in the response topics, which is this, Col the second line, Collins' work turns, turns ordinary, everyday activity into strange and exciting experiences and habits and explores the pleasures and troubles of everyday life. That's what I'm focused on. That's what I think most of these poems are focused on, is that turning ordinary everyday activity into strange and exciting experiences, habits, and explores the pleasures and troubles of everyday life. Um, the possibilities, the complications, the problems, and the victories of everyday life, common experiences, and if they're not everyday experiences, they are at least common to everybody sooner or later. Um, that is where I'm going to start with Sonnet because it's in the book. Um, this is a poem you have to know. This is one of Billy Collins' more literary poems. And because of that, and what I mean by that is you have to know a little bit about sonnets and the history of sonnets and what sonnets are for, for it to make sense. Sonnets were invented by this Italian poet named Petrarch, who you see mentioned near the end of the poem. They were originally intended exclusively as love poems. The first batch of sonnets that Petrarch wrote were all about his love for this woman named Laura. They were all to try to win her love and show how much he loved her. And then in, during the Renaissance, um, sonnets moved from Italian into English. The most famous English sonnets are all by Shakespeare. M many of them are also love poems. Um, traditionally, sonnets have 14 lines. Um, and they are grouped into the first four, the second four, the third four, and then a rhyming couplet at the end. So you get four, 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 and then two. This poem plays on that. Um, the first line says, all we need is 14 lines. Well, 13 now. So it's like one line down, 13 to go to get us to the 14. Um, they also, somewhere around the eighth or ninth line, traditionally have a, what, what poets call a turn. Where the, poem, where the poem goes from talking, like building up, to turning and showing you what the conclusion is going to be. This sort of, somewhere around that eighth or ninth line, you get the turn, and the turn is the turn towards the conclusion, or the turn towards the point of the poem, or something like that. He plays with that here, where he says, hey, but hang on here while we make the turn. So let's go through this poem, and maybe it'll make more sense as we go. All we need is 14 lines. Well, 13 now, so he's telling you sonnets are supposed to be 14 lines. And after this one, just a dozen. Okay, two down, 12 to go. To launch a little ship on love's storm-tossed seas. Okay, now we're getting down to the traditionally sonnets are supposed to be about love poems. Try to win the love of the person you want or show your love for them. And only 10 more left, like rows of beans. So now, four down, 10 to go. How easily it goes unless you get Elizabethan. Elizabethan um, refers to the Elizabethan era when Queen Elizabeth I was queen. That was when Shakespeare was alive. The late 1500s to the early 1600s. That is when sonnets became really popular in English literature. So that's what he's talking about. And insist the iambic bongos must be played. Iambic is traditionally, um, iambic means two syllables, unstressed and then stressed. Traditionally, um, English poetry is supposed to be an iambic pentameter, so it's supposed to be ten syllables, five iambics, five two-syllable iambics, which gets you to ten syllables. That's what he's talking about here. Rhymes positioned at the end the ends of lines. He's not doing that here, but if you want to get traditional and Elizabethan about it, that's what you have to do. One for every station of the cross. But hang on here while we make the turn. Again, he's saying we're eight lines in. Time to turn from building the poem to moving it towards its conclusion. Hang on here while we make the turn. 
into the final six where all will be resolved. We're, we're supposed to make, be making that turn now towards the resolution. Where longing and heartache will find an end. So we're getting the conclusion of the love poem. We're going from I'm longing for somebody and missing somebody and my heart is aching for somebody to the resolution where you get them or at least declare your love for them. Longing and heartache will find an end where Laura will tell Petrarch to put down his pen. So Petrarch's the sonnet has won and Petrarch has proved his love to Laura and Laura's like, all right, fine, I, I get it, you love me. Put down your pen. Laura will tell Petrarch to put down his pen, take off those crazy medieval tights, the kind of pants people wore in the 14, 1500s, blow out the lights and come at last to bed. So at the end, the sonnet worked and she's like, all right, fine, I believe you, stop writing poems and come to bed. So the sonnet accomplishes its poem. It, it, the sonnet accomplishes its point. And it has, she believes the, the poem, she believes that he loves her, and she's like, all right, I believe you, the sonnet worked, come to bed. And so that's what you get is this sort of silly, simple little take on the sonnet and what it is and what it's supposed to do and what it's for. This poem to show or prove your love, and it works. And so at the end, Laura, who's the subject of all the original sonnets, is like, all right, I believe you, you know, put, stop writing poetry and come to bed. Simple little poem, but it takes this complex literary genre that people are often like, oh, that's fancy literature, and just simplifies it. And it's like, it's a love poem to try to get this woman to like you. It works at the end. Um, then we're going to jump into the afterlife. Uh, this is one of those, you know, everybody doesn't die every day, but everybody dies eventually. And this poem is very much dedicated to investigating or exploring the idea of what happens after life? What happens? Where do people go after they die? You know, this question that a lot of people struggle with or ponder. While you are preparing for sleep, brushing your teeth, uh, riffling through a magazine in bed, the dead of the day are setting out on their journey. Okay, so everybody that died that day, they're, they're headed out to the afterlife. Where are they going? They're moving off in all imaginable directions, each according to his own private belief. That's the key to this poem. Once you understand those two lines, you understand this poem. Because what this poem suggests is whatever you expected to happen in the afterlife or whatever your belief or faith told you was coming in the afterlife, that's what you get. There is no one fixed afterlife. What you, you go where you believed you would go. This is the secret that silent Lazarus, if you don't know Lazarus, he died and was resurrected uh, in the Christian New Testament. This is the secret that silent Lazarus would not reveal. Lazarus knew this. You go wherever you believe you would go, but he wouldn't tell anybody. That everyone is right, as it turns out. You go to the place you always thought you would go. So it's your belief that directs where you go in the afterlife. The place you kept lit in an alcove in your head. So whatever you imagine the afterlife would look like in your mind, that's where you go. Some are being shot into a funnel of flashing colors, into a zone of light, white as January sun. So you're just becoming pure light, pure spirit. Others are standing naked before a forbidding judge who sits with a golden ladder on one side, a coal chute on the other. This plays with Dante's Inferno and the medieval idea of the judge who judges you and decides where you go in the afterlife. Some have already joined the celestial choir and are singing as if they have been doing this forever. Again, this sort of Christian amazing grace idea where you just join in this, you step out of time and into eternity and infinity and, and sing God's praises. While the less inventive find themselves stuck in a big air-conditioned room full of food and chorus girls. This is for the people who had didn't have spiritual faith but were like, what is the happiest, most joyful experience I can imagine? Well, it's just all the food I want and pretty women and all this kind of thing. Some are approaching the apartment of the female god, a woman in her 40s with short, wiry hair, glasses hanging from her neck by a string. With that one eye, she regards the dead through a hole in the door. This more simple, basic, less big spiritual idea. There are those who are squeezing into the bodies of animals, eagles and lepers, eagles and leopards, and one trying on the skin of a monkey like a tight suit, ready to begin another life in a more simple key. This sort of reincarnation as an animal, more simple life, stripped down, easier. 
while others float off into some benign vagueness, little units of energy heading for the ultimate elsewhere. There are even a few classicists being led to an underworld by a mythological creature with beard and hooves. He will bring them to the mouth of the furious cave guarded over by Edith Hamilton and her three-headed dog. This is Greek and Roman classical mythology um, with the, the animals and images of classical, classical mythology like Cerberus, the three-headed dog. Edith Hamilton, if you don't know her, is the most, she has the most famous book. Edith, Hamilton, Edith Hamilton's Mythology, which is most people's basic introduction to Greek and Roman mythology. The rest just lie back on their, lie on their backs in their coffins, wishing they could return so they could learn Italian or see the pyramids or play some golf in a light rain. Uh, and the rest just lie on their back in their coffins. These are the people that believe that when you died, there was nothing, that you were just dead, that after you died, that was the end of it. And so they believe that was the end, and when they die, that's what they get. They get what they imagined they would get. They wish they could wake in the morning, like you, and stand at a window examining the winter trees, every branch traced with the ghost riding of snow. And so what you get is this circling back at the end, which is the dead all wish that they could have what you have, which is one more day, one more experience, one, one more day full of possibilities, to, and some just smile forever on. They just want, uh, they, they wish that they could have what you have, which is to still be alive and still have the available sensory experiences that are available to you, even just looking out and seeing a you know, pretty scene of nature. Um, everybody else is going off into their whatever they imagined. The next one that I want to jump into here is The Best Cigarette. This is a surprising little poem about work, um, and it often surprises people. This is a poem about this person who, was, who smoked for a while and then quit smoking, um, but it plays with all the stereotypes of smoking and when people smoke. They take a smoke break at work or after dinner or something like that. You get that in the, in the, um, the first stanza of this, this poem. There are many that I miss, many cigarettes, many times when he smoked. Having sent my last one out a car window, the, the last cigarette he smoked, he threw it out a car window sparking along the road one night years ago. The heralded ones, you know, the ones that people are famous for, when people are famous for smoking. After sex, the two glowing tips, now the lights of a single ship. So these people smoking after making love. At the end of a long dinner with more wine to come. So everybody has a nice meal and then smokes a cigarette again, this traditional habit. And a smoke ring rise, coasting into the chandelier or on a white beach holding one with fingers still wet from a swim. So you go, for, you go to the beach, have a nice cigarette. How bittersweet these punctuations of flame and gesture. But it, the best cigarette was not all those famous ones that people think of and that you see in old movies and stuff like that. The best were on those mornings when I would have a little something going in the typewriter. The sun bright in the windows, maybe some barely oats on in the background. I go into the kitchen for coffee, and on the way back to the page curled in its roller, I would light one up and feel its dry rush mix with the dark taste of coffee. Then I would be my own locomotive trailing behind me as I returned to work with little puffs of smoke, indicators of progress, signs of industry and thought, the signal that told the 19th century it was moving forward. That was the best cigarette, when I would steam into the study full of vaporous hope and stand there, the big headlamp of my face, pointed down at all the words in parallel lines. And so what you get here is that the best cigarette was not all these famous cigarettes like after dinner or on the beach or after sex, all these stereotypes. No, the best cigarette was the one that was the work break cigarette. The, he, he'd gotten up and got to work and he took his first smoke break and he was like, I feel good about the work I'm doing and I've got some momentum, I've got some progress. And then he takes a break from the work and smokes, you know, as a little break from the work and then sits back down and is like, all right, back to work. I'm like a, like a train just, you know, rolling forward and, and I'm smoking just like, a, just like the smoke coming out of a train, like a locomotive. And so the best cigarette is not some stereotypical in the middle of some big, deep, meaningful movie moment. No, it's the cigarette, the little cigarette break that you take 
on the days when you're working and feeling good about work and you take a little break and then get back to work with, after that cigarette. And so the argument of this poem is sort of it's not the big dramatic moments. No, it's the little moments where, where you're, the smoke break is just a little break you take when you feel good about the work you're doing that day. The last poem that we're going to cover here is this poem called Splitting Wood. It's about splitting wood, splitting up, you know, chopping firewood for the, for the winter for your fire. This poem also is a response to a famous poem that's much older called The Woodpile by Robert Frost, which is why in the beginning of Splitting Wood, he says Frost covered this decades ago, where he's like, we've already had a poem about this. I'm going to try to write a new poem about this. So he's trying to take this thing that there's already a famous poem about and sort of revisit it and reboot it and talk about it in an interesting way. Frost covered this decades ago, and Frost will cover it again tonight. Now he's not talking about Robert Frost, the poet. He's talking about it's winter, which is why he's splitting firewood. And there's frost on the wood. Frost will cover it again tonight. The leafy disarray of this woodland now trimmed, now thinned down to half its trees. But this morning I stand here sweating in a thin shirt. He's sweating because he's been out there working, chopping firewood. As I split a stack of ash logs into firewood with two wedges, an axe and a blue-headed maul. So he's got an axe and one of those little splitting um, mauls that you put into the wood and then hammer down. The pleasures here are well known. Feet planted wide, silent, unstoppable flow of the downswing. So he's saying that there is this pleasure in just doing this sort of simple physical work. Coordination that is called hand-eye because the hand achieves whatever the concupiscent eye desires. When it longs for a certain spot, which in this case is the slightest fissure visible at one end of the log. So part of what you're trying to do when you split firewood is look for these little cracks and creases in the wood and hit them and split it apart. Where the thin insinuating edge of the blade can gain entry where the shape of its will can be done. I want to say that there's nothing like the sudden opening of wood, but it is like so many other things. And so he says there's nothing like splitting wood open and seeing it just split apart, fly apart if you've ever split wood or even seen it done. You know, you hit the wood and it just splits apart and it's sort of this amazing moment. But he says it's like so many other things when wood splits apart. The stroke of the axe, like lightning. The bisection, bisection that splitting apart, things being bisected. The halves fall away from each other as in a mirror. So you got two mirrored sides that, are, that have been split apart. And hit the soft ground like twins shot through the heart. And rarely, if the wood accepts the blade without conditions, the two pieces keep their balance. So if you do it just right and you hit the wood and split it apart, they don't fly apart. They just stand there split apart now. In spite of the blow, remain stunned on the block as if they cannot believe their division, their sudden separateness. Still upright, still together, they wobble slightly as two lovers, once secretly bound, might stand revealed, more naked than ever. So the, it's almost like the wood, now that it's split apart, you can see the insides of it. It's almost like it's naked. The darkness inside the tree they shared, now instantly exposed to the blunt light of this clear November day. All the inner twisting of the grain, he's talking about the insides of the wood and the grain of the wood and, and the little colors and shapes inside of it, that held them blindly in their augmentation and contortion now rushed into this brightness as if by a shutter that once opened can never be closed. And so it's almost like the wood has been stripped and made naked and exposed out in this you know cold November morning air. So it's almost like the splitting wood is this stripping and making naked of the wood um, and opening the parts of it that have never been exposed to the air, opening the inner parts of it that have never been exposed before. And so it turns into this much deeper, this, this simple splitting wood turns into this much deeper metaphor about being naked, about the wood being naked and being exposed and the sort of inner parts of, of you being opened up in the way that the wood is. So he, he this is where he says, I want to say there's nothing like the sudden opening of wood, but it is like so many other things, you know, things being exposed, inner things being brought out, those kinds of things is what's, what's happening right here as he exposes the wood. <coughs> that gets us through the four Billy Collins poems, uh, Sonnet, The Afterlife, The Best Cigarette, and Splitting Wood. That gets us through the, those four poems. And you can see how 
he turns ordinary everyday activity, doing little work like and taking a smoke break, splitting wood, even even dying, which everybody doesn't die every day, but some people die every day. It is this common, if you think about it in a larger way, it is this common experience that happens every day. How he turns ordinary everyday activity into strange and exciting experiences that are, that are worth exploring and pondering and thinking about and explores the pleasures and the troubles, the problems, the complications of those everyday experiences. This gives you several everyday experiences and he sort of stops and thinks about them a little deeper and explores them and investigates them. Hopefully that's helpful in thinking about this response topic and hopefully, hopefully it's helpful in helping you understand what each of these poems is about and what he's trying to do and how he's trying to explore these particular experiences. If you have questions about any of these, be in touch with me, email or whatever is easiest for you. Otherwise, um, we are done with these four Billy Collins poems. I look forward to seeing you all next time. Thank you all and have a good day.